Hi, dear friends, some words of Torah for Parshat Shalach. We encounter different historical periods that represent quantum leaps of advancement. Some leaps are technological. The development of tools in the Bronze Age was one such leap. The printing press of the 15th century was another. Another was the Industrial Revolution of the late 18th and 19th, early 19th centuries. Other civilizational leaps occurred in the realm of social structures and ideologies. Written language created sometime around 3200 BCE was one such game changer. Demonstration of a heliocentric model for the sun and planets in the 16th century was another. For the Jewish people, the most pivotal era of ideological quantum advancement and change was probably during our 40-year sojourn in the desert. You know, change can be frightening. Man tends to be more at ease when surrounded by things and experiences that are familiar to him. Changes to those surroundings, even when the change is positive, can be disorienting and threatening. Gutenberg's printing press was attacked by monks in the 15th century because they believed that mass production of the Bible by machine would A, put monks out of work and make them lazy, and B, put the Bible in the hands of common folk who weren't sophisticated enough to interpret the Bible properly. In retrospect, we realize just how absurd these criticisms were. But fear of change has always been the driving force behind resisting advancement, and it continues to this day with what is called techno-panic. The Jewish people also harbored gr this great fear of change as they were undergoing so many changes all at once. Not only had they been violently ripped from their homes in Egypt, their whole societal system was evolving from a slave class to independent landowners. While an outsider would see how glorious and positive this change was, we can only imagine the great trepidation the Jews experienced when considering all of these changes occurring in such a short span of time. This helps us at least sympathize with their anxious response when hearing the 10 spies' negative report. In looking carefully at their report, we note that at no point did the spies ever dispute the fact that the land was, as Hashem had promised, Eretz Zavat Chalavu Devash, a land flowing with milk and honey. They used those very words to describe how lush and plentiful the land was, and even brought back produce to prove that point. In fact, their main complaint was not at all about the quality of the land, but rather the fearsomeness of the inhabitants of the land. They said, Ephes ki az ha'am hayoshev ba'aretz. The only thing they said is, the indigenous nation is strong. Their cities are well fortified, and we saw members of the fierce Anak family there. They further complained about the Amalekites, a hostile nation they had already encountered in the desert, as well as other formidable Canaanite tribes. The only statement we can point to where the spies criticize the actual land is their words, Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha Hi, which is usually translated as, it is a land that consumes its inhabitants. But Rabbi Joseph Ibn Kaspi of the early 14th century was bothered by this reading. How could they contradict their own glowing report of the beautiful land just a few verses earlier? He instead translated that verse as, it's a land where the inhabitants of the land are consumers. That is, not that the land consumes its inhabitants, but the inhabitants consume the land. Even though the land produces a tremendous amount of bounty, the inhabitants are of such great size and strength that they have ravenous appetites and consume everything that the land produces. With this translation, the spies never disparage the land itself. But this reading is quite revealing because it not only was an intimidating testament of just how powerful the indigenous tribes of Israel were, it was also a suggestion that by entering the land of Israel, we too, B'nai Israel, even if we do succeed in our conquest, might fall prey to the allure of the land just as its current inhabitants have. They have become gluttonous consumers of the flowing milk and honey of the land. What will become of us? Will we not also become the insatiably hungry nation? Will our wealth and opulence do us in? 
This was yet one more frightening adjustment that the Jews realized that they'd need to make, a socioeconomic change from being impoverished slaves to wealthy and indulgent land barons. So this reading also provides a new meaning to their expressed fear about their wives and children. They said, Nashenu vitapenu yihiyu lavaz, our wives and children will be lavaz. Onkelos understands the word lavaz as being taken captives by the very strong tribes. The word can also, however, mean disgrace. Perhaps what they were saying is that if the land is so plentiful, then our success will become our failure. Our wives and children will lose their work ethic and become disgraceful couch potatoes instead. We should return to Egypt, they said, so that we can instill within our children the ethic of an honest day's hard work. In this sense, Hashem's decree that they would have to wander in the desert for 40 years wasn't so much a punishment, but a necessary waiting period of maturation and evolution. Seeing how the people couldn't handle such a sudden shock to their infrastructures, Hashem decreed that entry into the land would have to take an entire generation of adjustment before the next generation would be ready to become these wealthy landowners. But after Hashem's decree, the Torah details many mitzvot having to do with the korbanot, the sacrifices, and the laws of tithing. This makes sense if the fear of the Jews was that their newfound wealth would corrupt them. Hashem's response to this legitimate concern was that while it's true that wealth can corrupt, it can also be used for very positive things, like bringing gifts from one's blessings to Hashem and to the Kohanim. The Torah also repeats the laws of the sinner's sacrifice to remind the people that while wealth can induce sin, it's also possible to atone for sin by using that very wealth. This reading may also explain why our Parsha concludes with the story of the Mikoshesh Eitzim, the person who violated Shabbos by being Mikoshesh, by gathering sticks. Now, why did he do this, especially in light of our sages' teaching, that he was forewarned that his act was a violation of the Torah? Many of our sages understand that he acted l'shem shamayim, with virtuous intentions. He wanted B'nai Yisrael to witness that although they were not entering the Promised Land, the mitzvot were still binding upon them. He martyred himself for that cause. But perhaps a deeper meaning to his l'shem shamayim was that he wanted to remind B'nai Yisrael that while their concern about excessive wealth was founded, they also needed to remember that if Hashem is bringing us to a luxurious land where we'll be able to occasionally rest and luxuriate, then it is something that we can handle. Look how he commanded us to observe Shabbos, a day where we must desist from all work and resist the virtuous impulse for productivity. Note that the only other time that the verb likoshesh is used in the Torah is back in Exodus chapter 5, where the Jewish slaves in Egypt were commanded to gather straw to make bricks for their taskmasters. This man's stick gathering was to remind the Jews that hard work should not be romanticized to the point where we forget the suffering we experienced when hard work was taken to the extreme. We've recently undergone a societal paradigm shift because of the pandemic. Understandably, this has brought with it many changes in the way people live their lives and has also brought an accompanying anxiety and fear to many within the civilized world. This anxiety has manifested itself in so many different ways, and it's been important for the grown-ups in the room to try and restore a sense of calm and normalcy. Change also occurs within the Jewish community. I'm sure you may have noticed various small changes that have occurred and will continue to occur within our own beautiful Kihila, both within our Beit HaKneset and within the larger Jewish community. So we should all try to respond to those changes with positivity and optimism. If you question the change, you should consider, is my criticism founded on a genuine grievance that the change is a bad one? Or am I romanticizing a past that was beautiful when it existed, but that cannot or will not be any longer. My dear friends, may we learn to welcome change as part of God's unfolding plan of ultimate redemption. May we see it. Bimhera, biyamenu, amen. Here's wishing you a beautiful Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom.